You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And I'm Vince Heath. And this is the Watch and Thought of Razzalon. Today we're going to be talking about the second serial of the 17th season of Doctor Who, City of Death, which consists of four episodes that aired from September 29th, 1979 to October 20th, 1979. So close to the 80s. Two facts! And I want to give a special shout out to Matt Golden for getting us these episodes. Hey, thanks, Matt. Uh, you can follow him on Tumblr at mgoldentumbles.tumblr.com or possibly someplace else. Somehow just... Saying, hey, thanks, Matt, is the most popular thing I've ever done on this podcast. It's like a meme now. Hey, thanks, Matt. Today, we were going to have tons of guests. We opened this up to any any of our previous guests to be on it. All of them were busy or something. Except for one glorious human being. Hi. Vince and E.L. It's Vince. It's 041. That's the time right now. That means nothing to me, and I refuse to acknowledge Zero's it. Zero's not a time. It is. Hey, thanks, Vince, for being on the podcast. Hey, thanks, Joe and Tony, for having me on the podcast. I'm going to try to keep my voice down, because I've noticed whenever I record a podcast, I've noticed afterward that I talk very loud. I have this thing that's it's called autism spectrum syndrome. One of the symptoms that it's not across the board. Some people are, you know, nonverbal. I am kind of hyperverbal sometimes. I get very loud. I'm trying to concentrate really hard on not doing that because I'm not aware of it while it's happening. It's something I notice afterward. And I, I find it annoying uh, myself. And I'm sure many listeners have heard me on the podcast being very loud. I just want to say I'm, I'm trying my best right now to be on my, on my low voice. It feels very unnatural. It is something that takes a lot of concentration i will probably forget about it later in the show and i will get very loud and i'm sorry in in advance but that that is i'm i'm putting my cards on the table that's what i'm doing right now i'm struggling i like it it sounds like i'm listening to like a meditation a guided meditation it's very soothing i'm real relaxed right now i've got my i've got my npr pants on which is a reference to a radio station that i have no access to as a swedish person i feel like you're about to start talking to me about golfers i don't know sports but they have very few points and i think we're happy about that because i think that's the rules of golf you're supposed to have few points or you're supposed to get under par the everything i know about golf i learned from from mini golf mini golf well we all know i'm always sub bar so you can you can rely (laughs) on that that's good that's just what we want from from the golf announcer voice so, how have you been? I've been falling behind on Doctor Who. I've, this is this. It's been a long time since my last confession, but I, I have not been watching enough Doctor Who. For the sake of this podcast, I've skipped ahead to uh, this podcast uh, or this episode that or this serial that this podcast episode is about. I was on the Rebos operation, I think I watched last. Uh, I'm going to address a question that I heard on the podcast while also catching up on that. Uh, I have not, again, caught up on that yet because I was on the Rebos operation. But I, I heard a question from one of the other guests, and, and I think you, you, you guys uh, uh, passed it forward as well. I don't know how to make sentences uh, about the lyrics to the theme song that I wrote for the show. And I'd li- I, could, I could clarify. The question was, what, what are the lyrics to the theme song? And I can recite them. First, there's the intro, which is the, the Daleks is saying, Tony and Joe, you are ordered to watch every Doctor Who serial and discuss them all. Confabulate. 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 Then, then the lyrics go, the Watchathon of Rassilon. What you think? Don't hesitate to prattle on. Rassilon, Watchathon, doomed to fail or possibly go on too long. The Watchathon of Rassilon. 
If you like it, tell your friends to pass it on. Rassilon, Watchathon, ends as soon as Joe and Tony's thoughts are gone. And then I think there's a Dalek saying something that that about the 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 oven that uh, should should not be on during the show. It should be should be off so that you don't don't burn down the the kitchen. Which reminds me to remind you to 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 please make sure that your oven is off uh, so that your kitchen may be safe. It is. Is it? It's off. We haven't used it in, like, days. That's so. true, we haven't. Then you're probably fine, unless the kitchen has been burned down for days. Let's do it. Let's talk about the cereal. Let's let's get into it. City of Death, episode one. I have two titles. I don't like either of them. Why'd you always do two if you don't like them? Like, just pick one bad one and commit to it. Two bad ones doesn't equal one good one. Sure it does. I have a marvelous bouquet. Okay. And a crack in time. Those are both fine. I have no titles this time, but that's because I didn't have a lot of time to prep. Uh, I didn't take any notes either. I watched the, the whole serial today. So it's still pretty fresh in your memory then, though. Well, I was also doing some other stuff uh, at the same time. Uh, so I'm a little foggy, but I've seen it before as well, uh, years ago. Did you watch it before because of Douglas Adams? Yes, it was one of the first Doctor Who things I watched when I first got into Doctor Who. Because I'd watched, like, I'd watched a little bit of, of I think, Ninth and Tenth Doctors and maybe the movie. And then I watched just the Douglas Adams ones i think i watched the the other one before this one pirate planet and then and then city of death has he written any other ones technically he heavily rewrote uh the destiny of the daleks have i seen it uh no you haven't that's the last it was the last serial because yeah because that was the first serial of romana 2 and this is the second serial of romana 2 or as i like to call it romana 2 2 what it's the second serial of romana 2 so it's romana 2 Two, the second one. I see. So, where do we? What? 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 what happens? We start with a There's miniature. There's a spider orb. A little spider orb spaceship. Spiders. Explain. Explain what that means. I can't. We paint across like a de- like a desert, very barren landscape, and we see a, a spaceship that looks like an orb with spider legs. It's a spider orb. Okay, how many legs does a spider have? Eight. I'm not eight. a spider it's scientist. Eight. How many legs does this ship have? I don't know. I'm not a spaceship scientist. Three. It has three. So it can't be a spider. It's got little spindly spider legs. It's a tripod. It's a reference to uh, War of the Worlds, probably. They had three-legged spaceships. They had long spindly legs called tripods. It's a spider orb. Okay, inside this spider orb uh, is a... Green, wiggly, worm-faced looking guy. Wiggly, worm His face, face looks like a green brain. Yeah, it does. With an eyeball in it. Just the one, right? I can't remember. I think it's just one. Right there in the center. Yes. And his name is Scaroth, and he is of the Jaggeroths. Uh, so he's Scaroth the Jaggeroth. They're throwing a lot of things at you right at the beginning. Scaroth the Jagoff. That's what I remember it as. That's, that's close enough. He's inside the ship, and there's other voices over the radio being, like, referencing uh, Star Wars A New Hope by frequently saying, Save us. You are our only hope. He's like, oh, okay. And then the ship is taking off, and then it, it explodes. explodes. <laughs> so he, uh, he fucked up, he fucked up bad. real bad. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Matt. And then that's the last we hear of him. But uh, it's a really weird opening that doesn't come back for a while. Until the cliffhanger, really. So then we cut to... Paris, and we hear, um... It's super duper Paris. It is actually Paris. For real. All the time. The Doctor and Romana are on the Eiffel Tower, talking about how great Paris is, how marvelous it is. They say the word marvelous like seven times, and then the word bouquet like seven times. Hence my title, A Marvelous Bouquet. And they talk about how Paris, they, they compare Paris to like wine and how, and years to wine specific too as well. Cause it's like a year in a place has like a, a certain bouquet about it. And this one's not particularly good bouquet, but it's still Paris. So it's fine. They're like, they go to leave and we get a series, a montage of 
shots that are like, look, we're in Paris. It's Paris. We're in Paris. We shot on location. Here's all the footage. I got a sense that a lot of the decision making here was we want to go to Paris. Let's just make a lot of excuses to go to Paris so that they can't tell us you can't go to Paris to shoot this. Actually, it was the other way around. The script was not originally set in Paris. It was actually about and it wasn't about the Mona Lisa. It was about casino gambling somehow. What? Then somebody was like, hey guys, I got it. I got it so we can film in Paris. So they rewrote it to be in Paris. So they got the permission or whatever to film in Paris and then rewrote a script to who be in Paris. Who was the guy who was like, who just went out and did that? It was a producer. He was just like, man, I really want to go to Paris. Well, I don't have it. We don't have a script set there or anything. I'll just, if I get the permission, they'll have to go. <laughs> I don't know. But like, there's so many. Okay, here's my thing. There's so many shots of like, we're in Paris. Look at how much Paris there is. There's so much Paris. And there's no dialogue or anything happening. It's literally them just like walking and trying to like cross the street. And it starts off with them on the Eiffel Tower looking out. We never see a shot of the actual Eiffel Tower. I'm pretty sure. Really? I don't remember I a single like there's shot. At least one. There's them on it. I think there's a shot with the the Arc de Triomphe in the background, but I don't think you can see the Eiffel Tower. I made gifs of this whole serial. I was like purposefully looking for a shot of the Eiffel Tower. There's shots from the Eiffel Tower, but not of it. But not of it. Because there's that, the spoilers, the very last shot is them waving up at Dugan in the Eiffel Tower. But you just see Dugan's point of view. You don't actually see the Eiffel Tower. So they went to Paris. They went all this trouble to go to Paris. And they didn't get the, like, biggest thing there. I get it. Sometimes you do all your shooting at a location. And then it's like, now it's time to get the establishing shot. And it's like, no, I'm ready to go home. I'm just going to look up a picture of it from a Google. To be fair... Everybody gets the shot of the Eiffel Tower. If they had just gotten the shot of the Eiffel Tower, it would have just been like everyone else's shot of the Eiffel Tower, and it wouldn't be special. But they could have, could have had a shot of the Eiffel Tower with the Doctor in it. The Doctor and the Eiffel Tower in the same shot. What I do for a living is I scan photographs. I scan a lot of photographs from people going on vacation to all of the obvious places that go- people go to on vacation. They take all of the obvious pictures, and they all look the fucking same. I get so tired of seeing the same Mayan statues or whatever it is, and the same church windows, and the same... <sighs> So I can totally understand somebody going to Paris and just not taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower. Because, like, I've seen pictures of the Eiffel Tower so many times. I don't need to see another one. I've got a picture of me holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Only I don't because I lost that camera at an airport. Oh, I've seen a couple of those, too. My favorites are the ones where you see a picture of... like All the taking, people doing it? Yeah, yeah. Someone's taking a picture of everyone doing it. It's great. So they, they, they're, they've left the Eiffel Tower. Romana's like, where are we going? And the doctor says, philosophically or geographically? And she says, philosophically. And he goes, oh, well, we're going to lunch. That's some good dialogue. That's specifically very Adamsy. Yeah, there are a bunch of Adamsy moments like that in this serial, especially between the Doctor and Romana. Romana has changed outfits as well. I don't remember what she's wearing. She's got the hat that somehow stuck to the back of her head. Oh yeah, she's got kind of a little schoolgirl thing going on. Which she she ever wears anything else? I've literally only seen this Romana in this serial. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this one, like, it made me think of, like, Annie Hall sort of style. She apparently picked, like, a schoolgirl-ish outfit because she was like, I know, like, schoolgirls hate wearing this sort of outfit, so it'd be like... I did. So kids would be like, oh, cool, she's wearing what I wear, and that'd be neat. And then she's like, but then I forgot there are gross dads who, oh, man. who would say gross things. And then, then she's like, now nah, kind of, maybe I should have picked something different. <laughs> It's a nice gesture. Yeah. Gross dads ruin everything. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't speak from personal experience of, of, of having a dad who ruins everything because my dad died before he had time to ruin anything. But, but yeah, dads ruin a lot of things. My dad's pretty good. Yeah, my dad's pretty good. Hey, dad. Love you. I specified gross dads. Yeah, gross dads. Gross dads are bad. And gross non-dads. Just gross people. Gross people are bad. <laughs> That's a stance we're taking here and now. No more gross people. And this is philosophically, not geographically gross people. 
<laughs> I don't know what that is. A gross of people. How much is a gross? 12? I don't That's know. That's a dozen. Gross is more than a dozen? Man, we should learn some, thing- some God, things. We really should. Or, or just s- s- switch to metric. It's so much easier. To be fair, I don't think I've ever, ever, like, used gross as a measurement, so. Isn't it like 20? I don't even know. It is 12 dozen. It's 12 dozen? It's 12 12? Yeah, 144. Why do we need a number for 144? <laughs> I mean, it's a dozen dozen. How many inches are in a foot? 12. Yeah, it's 12, 12 inches to a foot. So if there was 144 feet, those would be... Well, that, that doesn't be... have shit to do with feet and inches. Okay, but... There's only baked goods and nothing else. 144 feet, though, would be... A, a gross of feet? It'd be a gross of feet. What the fuck are you saying? It'd be gross feet. It would It would be gross feet. Yeah, I just wanted to say gross feet. Thank you. All right, what are we talking about? So we cut to uh, a scientist type. You can tell because he has a lab coat. Uh, his name is Professor Karinsky. And his accent is... Uh, question mark. He definitely has one. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a little bit Dracula. It's a little bit like... Rock and roll. Polish. It's a little bit Russian. It's a little bit Italian. I think he's supposed to be Italian, but I can't really tell for sure. Wait, really? Didn't they say that like later in the serial, like in part four or something, that he's Italian? I think so. Might be completely wrong. I mean, we are in Italy, right? No, France. I know things. I don't know if that was a joke or not. Shit, I'm so tired. Where do you... (laughs) Where do you think Paris is? Sorry. Well, Paris is in Canada, to be fair. We go to Italy later in this serial, though. Italy is in this serial, right? There's a Paris... There's Paris in a lot of different states. There's a Paris, Texas. There's a Paris, Illinois, I think. And all of them have a tiny Eiffel Tower. Every single one. There's also an Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas. That's not even a Paris. We do go to Italy later. That's what I was thinking of. Okay. We do. So the, part of the serial takes place in Italy. No, you're right. It does. That's where my brain went. Okay. I'm not stupid. Okay. Maybe a little bit. Wait, there's a London in Canada. Is there a, is there a France in... Is there a Paris in Canada? Is there a France in Canada? There's everything in Canada. I get confused. I've never been to Canada. Well, there's a lot of French stuff in Canada. Like, they speak French in Canada. Do they speak French in London in Canada? I don't know. I don't know. I just I just felt like I needed to say that in case I said something super false earlier. Because I got not sure if there's actually a Paris in Canada. This is not a podcast of facts. True. We don't know anything. That is a fact. So, Professor Kerensky is working for Count Scarlioni. Wait, so his name is Kerensky. That makes me think he's not Italian. That depends how it's spelled, I think. I mean, it might be Russian. K-E-R-E-N-S-K-Y. I don't know all of the specifics, but I want to say Polish, but I can't say for sure. Because I'm, 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 I get really not sure when it comes to the, to the Inskis. So where, so where does Scarlioni come from? That sounds Italian. But he's not from around here. Uh, Professor Kerensky is working for Count Scarlioni. Count Scarlioni... Uh, is a very uh, rich-looking dude. He was the guy that played Richard the Lionheart in The Crusade. Uh, he wears a suit. He's got some nice hair. He looks he looks pretty snazzy. He, lo- he looks like a Bond villain. And basically, Kerensky is like, I'm doing this experiment for you, and I'm really worried because I need lots more money, and we're going to need lots more money. I need lots more money. Scarlione is like, Kay. don't don't worry about it. I'll be your sugar daddy. And um, talks with his butler, whose name is Herman, uh, and says, hey, let's sell the Gutenberg. And he's like, I don't know, we've been selling a lot of art lately. We're, we're you know, going to get people sniffing around us because we're selling too much art. It's not art, it's a, it's the Bible. But yeah, they've been selling art, though. Yes. And, I guess, the Bible. Artifacts. So he's going to sell all this art to make money to fund his experiments. We cut to a cafe where the doctor flips through a book... And apparently he's a speed reader. There's a lot of jokes in this serial. A lot of jokes. Like, he's, he barely even looks at it. He just goes... Pfft. And then Romana's like, how's the book? And he's like, eh, it got a little boring in the middle. And then he's like, don't turn around. There's this guy drawing you. I don't entirely know what the purpose of this scene is. There's a guy that is drawing Romana's portrait, I guess. And then she turns around and he gets, like, pissed off. Like, how dare you look at me? 
And he crumples up the drawing and throws it to the ground. And then she goes to pick it up to see what it looks like. And then everything goes wobbly. And it repeats. And we see that scene again. And then they're like, oh, that was weird. Did you feel something weird? That was weird, right? But then they look at the picture and he's drawn Romana, but her face is a is a fractured clock. And the doctor's like, says something about, I don't know, a crack in time. It's somehow tied in with the thing that just happened. I don't get it. Well, it's like the, the character of the artist, like, isn't an important person who comes back up. Like, this is supposed to be some sort of clue or something to things that were happening, but I don't honestly get it. Doesn't 100% make sense to me. An- another thing that they, they, they say something about, they make observations about the likeness with regard to how, how much that clock looks like Romana. I don't know. It's It's a scene that's like, it's not a bad scene, but I don't entirely understand what the point of it was. Yeah. I mean, it sets up the idea of, like, something's broken with time, and that's pretty much it. But I don't know... The particulars of it, like, aren't important. Yeah, it's more symbolic. And it also leads to her being like, the computers on Gallifrey make better art than this. And he's like, computers? I hate computers. Fuck computers. The doctor hating computers has always been very weird to me. Because he's a... From the future? Science nerd. He hates computers. And he's like, I'm going to show you real art. So we walk through Paris for three more hours. And then eventually... We see the Mona Lisa. Uh, and he's like, this is real art. And she's like, eh, it's fine. She ain't got no eyebrows. Is it just me? Or, or was the Mona Lisa noticeably a fake? Yes. I mean... I mean, it. It you could recognize it as the Mona Lisa, but you could also recognize it as not the Mona Lisa. I mean, I, yeah, I doubt they had permission to actually film the Mona Lisa. But, like, it's not a print of the Mona Lisa. It's it's somebody somebody actually painted a slightly sickly-looking, slightly sickly-looking Mona Lisa, uh, which I guess makes sense because you wouldn't probably have even the technology to print out uh, usable. I don't even know what kind of printing they had access to at the BBC. And they probably just got some guy to paint him up real quick. And they're like, don't worry, we'll, we won't, like, focus on it super closely. <laughs> also, TVs used to look shittier, so you can get away with it. But the doctor is looking at the Mona Lisa for too long, and a tour guide comes up and says, Hey, stop hogging the Mona Lisa. There are other people here. And then Romana comes up and taps him on the shoulder and is like, what did she say? And then the whole scene repeats again. The time slippy thing happens again. The doctor gets all wobbly and passes out on top of a woman who we've previously established in this scene is sketchy because the camera focused on her and this other guy and looking sort of suspicious. So he falls on top of her and then he tries to stand up and bumps into this other guy in a trench coat. And the guy's like, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. I just hit my head on your gun. And he's like, what? And he like starts to pull his gun out of his thing. He gets stopped before he pulls the gun out, but the guy sort of like, ah, and gets away. Count Scarleone and the professor are what is causing these time slips, but it's only doing it for like a couple seconds, and he wants to like expand the amount of time that it will affect. Uh, he wants to go back further, and then the professor's like, okay, but I need food and sleep. And uh, he lets him go to sleep. So that was nice of the count. So then the Doctor and Romana are leaving and are being followed by Duggan. Doug- I-, I haven't even said what his name is. Duggan is the guy that uh, the Doctor hit his gun with his head. He's this guy in a trench coat. And he looks suspicious. He's goofy as hell. He is very goofy as hell. There's nothing about him that looks in any way threatening. He looks like a small child pretending to be a spy. I think this character was written to be American, and then they they cast someone who wasn't American, so they changed it to British. Like, that makes sense to me. He feels like an American cop stereotype. Or, like, detective, specifically. Yeah. Um, But the doctor, when he collapsed on the woman, stole her bracelet. Because he's like, this is a, uh, it's really advanced tech, it's too advanced for Earth. And they're going to use, he assumes they're going to use, they were using that to uh, scan the Louvre for, like, security stuff so they could steal the Mona Lisa. I found a piece of phlebotanum. And also he says something like, oh, also, we're, like, totally being followed, right? And she's like, yeah, I noticed. And he's like, hey, do you remember that guy I was talking about that was following us? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, well, he's 
currently poking a gun in my back. <laughs> that was another good Douglas Adamsy moment. Yes, there's so many good good gags in this in this serial. I think this might be the funniest Doctor Who serial we've had so far, or at least purposely funny. At least in a while. I mean, there were some some pretty good gags with the uh, the the second Doctor and Jamie. I don't think there's been anything as like consistently funny. Dugan has taken the Doctor and Romana to this cafe. And they are followed by two of these henchmen. They want that bracelet that the doctor stole. And so he he hangs it on the gun of the henchman. And then they take it away. And Duggan thinks that this was a bluff. And that he's that the doctor is actually working for Count Scarleone. Uh, and they're like, who's Count Scarleone? And he asks somebody like, he's just like, oh, you don't know who Count Scarleone is? He's like the biggest bad guy in the whole town. Um, and exposit. He like very quickly switches to their side too. Like at no point does he just be like, I don't trust you, doctor. He does like him at first, but then is quickly like, yeah, I'm on your side. So the henchmen return that bracelet to the count and the count's like, thank you, but too slow and orders his uh, butler to murder them. <laughs> this scene always frustrates me in anything that it's in because it's like how are you gonna find more people now nobody's like really trying to get that job if they know the last guy was murdered not even for like a really good reason and it's always just like a hey we're establishing just how evil this guy is he just kills his own people all the time for no reason but every time i'm always like that's just not a good use of resources (laughs) like it's not evil it's just dumb well it is evil i mean it's it is evil but but it's also really dumb. Sure. And, well, to be fair, he apparently has more than enough because he sends two completely separate henchmen to go get the doctor. Duggan, the doctor and Ramon are still at that cafe and they are still talking about exposition. And he's talking about how all these art forgeries have been popping up, but they don't look like forgeries. They look like the real thing, but they have to be forgeries. And then those henchmen come in because they didn't leave the cafe. They just sat there with the bad guys know where they were at. And they they come and pick him up. the the count the the woman who had the bracelet she's the countess. I guess she, is she married to Scarleone? Yes. And uh, she's like, where is the count? I need to go talk to him. And Herman's like, he's in the basement. So she goes down there, but she can't get the door open. And he's like, looks at a mirror and then rips his face off. He doesn't pull his mask off. He rips it up. How many of those things does he have? He rips it into two separate pieces. Like, hey, you're going to go through those if you keep doing that. And it reveals that he's the green brain guy from the beginning. And that is the first cliffhanger. As the end of episode one, we are now into episode two, which I I still have two titles for. Uh, And I actually like both of these. Who Came First and The Cellular Accelerator. Ooh. All right, those are pretty good. I call it episode two. Hey, right, that's Tony's joke. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. I took it. Not this episode. I take all the low-hanging fruit. So uh, Herman the butler escorts Dr. Romana and Duggan into the Count's mansion, manor, house. Uh, and he shoves the doctor into the room, and the doctor falls down behind a chair and gets up. And, and then like, the best scene probably in all of Doctor Who happens. Yeah, this whole scene is just delightful to watch. But he's just like, ooh, I love your your butler. So violent. <laughs> and then proceeds to do the, the the next portion of the scene while walking around on his knees. And he's like, uh, I'm the doctor, this is Romana and, and Duggan. And, uh, then he's like, he's like, you haven't offered me a drink. And he's like, oh, I'll do it. And like, he just starts getting everybody drinks. And then he proceeds to say that they are art thieves. Him and Romana are art thieves. And Duggan is a detective who Who is kind enough to catch them. Yes, because that's his job. Yeah, that's a good moment. The Countess says she thought that Duggan was following her around. And the doctor says, oh, well, you're a beautiful woman. Probably. uh, That feels like something I would say. (laughs) This is the second time he's been, like, unaware of, like, attractiveness. I like that. I like the idea very much. I find that relatable. Sort of leans into sort of a face sort of doctor. Yeah. Um, Or face blind, because that's also a thing. That comes up in the 12th Doctor era, right? Or just alien and not part of the whole human thing. Not into it. I've heard headcanons that, like, Time Lords are a lot more psychic of a people, and so they recognize, especially since they're changing faces all the time anyway, like, it's not useful. (laughs) It's not a useful way to recognize people. 
And so you recognize them more on their, like, psychic imprint than you would their face. And so, like, the doctor is just not great at reading faces. That makes sense. So Romana picks up this box and is told to put it down. And she's like, it's a puzzle box, right? She's like, yeah, you'll never open it. And then she proceeds to open it and pulls out the bracelet. Uh, Then the count comes in. The countess introduces everybody. And the doctor waves and says, hello there. And I have seen that wave so many times. It is, like, popularly used as a gif on Tumblr. Yeah. He's, like, sort of leaning into shot and waving. And it it's weird seeing the I've used, origin of a meme. <laughs> I've used this whole scene before in promos. And so it, when it, like, happened, I was like, oh, I've seen this. I know it's funny. And then the doctor says that uh, they're like, why did you steal this bracelet? And he's like, because pretty. It's pretty. I thought it was nice. It's, it's a cool looking thing. They're basically about to be taken away, and Duggan, in order to stop this from happening, picks up a chair and is going to chuck it at somebody. The doctor's like, oh, put that down, that is very expensive. I think he specifically says what type of chair it is, but I don't remember what it is. A Louis Quinn's or something like that? Fancy. It's fancy. I don't know if you guys have picked up on it yet, but Duggan's whole shtick is, uh, I'm gonna hit it. And normally that sort of thing bugs the hell out of me, but, like, it's hilarious in this serial. somehow charming when he does it. I get real Ian vibes from him. Yeah, he's a big goofball. So they are taken into the lab, which the doctor wants to fiddle with stuff, and they're like, no, no, we're putting you into a cell. Get over here. And they get locked in this uh, cellar room, and uh, Duggan's very mad, and we should have, we had, like, all these opportunities to escape, and the doctor's like, yeah, but... Now we can escape and they won't know about it. And we can figure out what they're doing before we leave. And Duggan's like, ah, yeah, that's smart. So they're going to uh, work on the door. The doctor tries to use his sonic screwdriver on the door, but it doesn't work. So Duggan grabs the sonic out of his hand and just starts smacking it into the door. Which makes the sonic screwdriver work. This is the, the doctor is like, oh, I should have you fix all my stuff. <laughs> He's like, I think he specifically says, would you consider being my scientific advisory? <laughs> advisor, sorry. Romana notices there's a size inconsistency. Uh, she's like, the stairs were this big, and this room is this big. That doesn't make sense. There's basically a, a hidden room. Well, she doesn't straight up say that, though. She doesn't go, hey, there could be a hidden room. She just says, it's different, and then, like, starts fiddling with stuff in the background, and we have no idea what she's doing, because the doctor goes to, like, fiddle with the machines. I mean, you can guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't know. I knew, because I'm smart. Okay. <laughs> um, because there's a bit later where, like, the doctor's like, aren't you curious what she's doing? And he's like, yes. And he's like, me too. But then the professor comes in. And they have to hide. And he, the professor starts messing with the machine. The doctor comes up behind him and starts talking to him. And but the, we see the machine and he puts an egg on the whatever it is, the device. And it turns the egg into a chicken real quick. And like progresses time forward. And then the doctor's like, well, that's great. I mean, except that it's wrong. And then the chicken turns into bones. Or it's going too fast or whatever. And he's like, well, this is what you can do. And he goes and he flips some switches. And then the... Bones, turn back into a chicken, turns back into an egg. He reversed the polarity. Yep. I think it's been a very long time since he said reverse the polarity. And here's another thing that happens that I don't understand. He's staring at the, where the, the egg is, the device, and he sees that worm face, the Jaggeroth's worm face. Why is it that it's going, going back in time and showing him the past? Why is his face just there? Well, you see, it happens because that's the way that they wrote it. I don't even remember what we're talking about. The doctor gets distracted because he reversed the polarity and the egg fixes itself, but he looks over and he sees Scaroth's face just in the thing. And I don't know why. And he's distracted by this and Duggan comes up behind the professor and thumps him over the head. And the doctor turns to talk to him. And, uh, he's like, oh no, he's passed out. And Duggan's like, no, I hit him. And, uh, the doctor is not happy. (laughs) But then, yes, Romana has found a room. So they go to check it out. And they're like, it's a 400-year-old room. We can tell. Meanwhile, upstairs, the Count is giving a demonstration of how they're going to steal the Mona Lisa. They're in this, like, room with, like, a painting behind a plexiglass thing. And he's got a thing that cuts the glass down and then... He's got a, there's like laser beams that shoot down in front of it. He's got a device that pushes the laser beams away, pulls out the painting. 
and then he presses a button, and the whole room changes, and we real we find out we're still inside of his that main like mansion manor house room that we've been in. He's got like some sort of really rad projector that uh, you can interact with. It's like a virtual reality type of thing. Yeah, he's got some real advanced tech. Meanwhile, downstairs, uh, they're trying to break into this uh, this room, and well, I'll do, Duggan's also talking about he knows. But, like, why would you sell the Mona Lisa? Who would buy the Mona Lisa? Because, you, you know, it's such a popular thing. You can't, like, sell it because you can't even, like, show it because people know it's stolen. You can't, yeah. You can't even sell it. And Duggan's like, no, I know of at least seven people who would buy it just to have in their own personal collection. And then uh, they're like, we can't get this wall down. And Duggan's like, don't worry. That's my specialty is knocking shit down and breaking things. And he just runs through the wall. He knocks it down with his body. <laughs> I think I agree with the Ian remark. Yeah, it's very Ian. You're like, oh, you're so stupid, but kind of cute. So they go in there and they open uh, this cabinet. And inside is a Mona Lisa. And they open another door. And there's another Mona Lisa. It's just full of Mona Lisa's. It's Mona Lisa's all the way down. And I think I think when he opens the first one, he's like, this is real. This is not a fake. And then he opens the second one, and it's just exactly the same. Yeah, and then he like, takes a minute to look at every single one of them, and he goes, they're all real. So two things. At this point, I was thinking, one, maybe it's some sort of time paradox, and they were literally all the Mona Lisa taken from different points in time. That's not the case. Uh, but also, they all do look incredibly different. <laughs> all of the faces look slightly different, every single one of them. But that's that's just because I'm, I assume that all the paintings were different and not a story thing. The way that he recognizes it is he recognizes the brush strokes. He looks very closely, and he recognizes the brush strokes and the uh, the pigment, I think, as that used by da vinci which makes sense i think because da vinci did have a, a strange relationship with with paint and layers and stuff he he had his own way of doing things from what i understand which is why it's a nightmare to try to restore any of his works because they're so fragile yeah he didn't really do things the usual way he had odd methods so they start discussing and they're like Oh, you said there are seven people who would buy the Mona Lisa. Well, there's seven paintings. They're going to go steal it and then sell all seven of these saying that it's the stolen Mona Lisa. Which for a minute I was like, why do they even got to steal it at all? But then it's like, you have to be like, I have, you know how it was stolen? You know how everybody knows it was stolen? I've got it. Exactly. It's actually a fairly smart plan, I feel like. Yeah, normally with with like complicated time travel plots like this, I'm always like, your plan is overcomplicated and stupid. This one's pretty good. And then uh, they immediately get caught by Scarleone. I just want to read the transcript because, again, such good lines. Uh, the doctor says, can I ask where you got these? And he says, no. Right. Or how you knew they were here? No. They've been bricked up a long time. Yes. I like concise answers. <laughs> I love that whole scene. Ah, it's so good. So much good dialogue on this one. Yeah. The T made a click sound. I'll be right back. In the meantime, say mean things about me. Vince is so nice. How dare he be so nice and kind and considerate. That's the worst. You know what? He's also a great musician. How dare he be so good at all that music that I love. You know what? Vince is also a really good writer. What a dick. What a good friend Vince is. How dare he? What a asshole. Hi. Hi. Were you just complimenting my asshole? That's not what I asked for. <laughs> Vince has such a good asshole. This is this is very, very inappropriate. <laughs> So speaking of good lines, here's another good line. Scarleone says uh, that he came down to find Kerensky, the professor. And the doctor says, oh. And Scarleone says, but he doesn't seem to be able to speak to me. And the doctor says, oh. And Scarleone says, can you throw any light on that? And the doctor says, no. And Duggan says, I can. And throws the fucking lamp at him. <laughs> ah, I love this serial so much. That is a fantastic... Joke, line, action, everything. It's a good gag. He literally threw some light on it. Mm -hmm. Tony, he threw the light 
No, I got it. At well, him. Yeah. I understand. That is clever. Yeah, and yeah, also it if it's, it fits in with Duggan's char- character of, of breaking things <laughs> and hitting people. Breaking things is literally just a characteristic trait of him. Literally the next shot is they're like sneaking around and then you hear some crashing and then Duggan just comes out shrugging like, what? <laughs> we don't even know what he did. <laughs> he just broke something. And then he sees somebody, he grabs a vase, Runs over and smashes him over the head with it, and it's the Countess. The Doctor's like, why did you do that? And he's like, she was gonna, like, rat us out or whatever. And the Doctor's like, no, that's a Ming vase. So then the Doctor's like, uh, you guys go stop the Mona Lisa from being stolen. I'm gonna go to Italy and uh, talk to uh, a Renaissance painter. Peace! And uh, he goes to, breaks into a gallery and gets in his TARDIS and, and heads to talk to Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo is... Not in at the moment. He ain't home. And he's like making a lot of like, you know, Leonardo jokes. Saying like, oh, all of your paintings like really took off. And I know this helicopter, this helicopter thing takes a lot longer to take off, but we'll get there. And then he bumps into a guy with a sword who's like wearing some knight armor stuff. He's like, Leonardo da Vinci isn't here, but uh, some other guy is. I don't remember what he said his name was. And then the door opens and who is it? It's the Count. It's uh, Count Scarleone, but with like longer hair. So Tony had no idea who he was. It's true. I did it. And he, he's dressed like Robin Hood. Tony was like, who is this guy supposed to be? And I was like, that's the Count. He had different hair. It's a wig. He has the same face, though. Question, though, with what we learn about him later, why does he have the same face? Where does he get those faces? That's not his real face. Well, I'm just going to say it. So the reason his deal is that he's been like fractured he's kind of got a clara thing going on he's been like fractured throughout time so there are pieces of him uh all over but you're right the face that he has is a mask maybe just for consistency's sake where it's just like if you were a person and you were going to design a mask you're always going to design the same mask because of who you are as a person or maybe it was kind of prepared he maybe had like a human face mold on the ship or whatever that's like this is this is the human face number th- 3 and that's the one he's got and, and to be clear it's not like he's living in a linear fashion like He's living all of these separate lives concurrently, yes. right? Yeah. So he like he's kind of in tune with like his past selves as well, like. But like I assume they're like going along the same sort of timeline. So like a year is a year for him. That's kind of what I'm assuming. I don't know. All the thirty year old versions of him are spread out throughout. Does that make sense? So it's a it's a little bit Doctor Manhattan as well. But yeah, but even though like even though like Doctor Manhattan is like he's still sort of going through time linear, linearly, but he he no remembers all of it. At once. But this is like separated, different. He's fractured. Yeah. Through time. I, that's what I said. I already <laughs> explained it. And they're all sort of mind linked a little bit. But that's in episode three, which that was the end of episode two. And we're now into episode three, which I've called Last of the Jaggeroth. Which I've called episode three. So Romana and Duggan go to the Louvre, which is empty except for a dead guard. And they're like, oh shit, we're too late. Duggan fucking sets off the alarm. He's like, this is where the Mona Lisa is supposed to be. And like, touches it, which sets off the alarm. And they're like, we gotta get out of here. So what does Duggan do? Jumps through the fucking window. He breaks something. He's such a good character, and I like him a lot. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go grab the tea, which is now steeped, probably. I'll be right back. In the meantime, you can say nice things about each other. <laughs> I love you. You're okay. You're all right. You're fine. You're neat. Neat? Neat. Neato. You're not neat. You're very messy. Well, that's not entirely true. It is. I'm very proud of you. Why? Because you did a whole season of a TV show. I did do a whole season of a TV show. You're writing a TV show right now. Yeah, but that's nothing to be proud of. What? Yeah, it is. Okay. You've got your own show, too. You're making it happen. Not yet. Maybe one day. You will. It'll be fine. Tony, when I look at you... Don't. Don't. (laughs) Don't. Listen to me. (laughs) Don't do it. I see no evil. God damn it! Wow, we could talk about nice things about Vince for far longer than we could talk about nice things about ourselves. I like your eyes? What color are they? Brown. (laughs) 
I've been married to you for you don't know so many years. You don't know three years. No, nope. four. Yep, four whole years. So I know what color your eyes are. Welcome back. So the professor Kerensky wakes up from being bumped on the head by Duggan and finds all of the Mona Lisas and the passed out count. And he's trying to wake up the Count, who starts mumbling a line that he finishes in the past uh, as he's talking to the doctor uh, in Italy. And he sort of gives his whole backstory. Well, actually, he's like, he's like interrogating the doctor, but the doctor's getting things out of him more so. Because the doctor's good at, good at that, about switching it around on people. But uh, the Count says he's the last of the Jaggeroth, uh, and he's going to be their savior. And then he talks about how he was scattered through time. The doctor has a has a line that I quite liked, and I'm going to butcher it, but it was something to the effect of, well, if, if you're the the last one, they can't be that there can't be that many to save." Yeah, that's a good point. But he ha- he he he's going to fix that too. But he also talks about his Mona Lisa plans, which is you know he's making Leonardo da Vinci paint all these Mona Lisas, and then he's going to storm in that that cabinet until he can sell them all to fund his experiments. His time travel experiments it's also interesting that the the doctor would uh himself eventually spend some time thinking he's the last of his kind but he doesn't come up with some weird plan to sell mona lisa's he should he does kind of retcon it though Scaroth goes to get some torture stuff and tells the guard to confiscate his tongue if he moves and the doctor is like well how can i talk if i don't have a tongue and he's like you can write can't you good point <laughs> And then uh, the doctor fucks with the guard some uh, guard a bit. He um, well, first he's like, ah, oh, you know, it you it must be tough humor in that guy, huh? He's a real he's a real dick, right? We we both don't like this guy, right? And the guards basically like, you can't trick me that easily. I get paid pretty well. And uh, I think he said something about, I see your point. And he's like, also I like stabbing people. And he's like, yeah, I see your point. And then he pulls a camera out of his pocket? I don't know. Sure. He's like, don't worry, it's nothing nothing weird. And he's like, smile for me. And the guard puts on this, like, weird grimace. And he takes his picture. He's like, come look at it. He's like, it's like a, like a Polaroid. And he's like, shakes it. And he's like, come look at it. And he comes closer and the doctor just knocks him in the jaw. Knocks him out. And then he goes and he gets all of the Mona Lisa paintings and writes on the back of them, This, this is, is a fake. fake. On all of them. And then he writes a letter to Leonardo da Vinci telling him, Sorry for writing on the back of these. Just paint over it. It'll be fine. He writes it backwards. Because that's how Leonardo writes. We see this because he puts a mirror in front of it so you can read it. The audience can read it. But then uh, the Count returns with some thumb screws. Then the Count wakes up in the present day in the Mona Lisa cave. To the Mona Lisa mobile! And proceeds to just... Eat some scenery. <laughs> he is just going full blown evil villain. He it's is great. having so much fun. I don't even remember what he's saying though. He's just like, I will fix everything and I'm very evil. Blah! Okay, so now we go to the cafe. Romana and du- Duggan both break into a cafe in separate ways. Uh, <laughs> Romana sonic screwdrivers her way in. Which must mean she has her own sonic screwdriver, because the doctor still has his. Mm. And she very carefully breaks her, like, uh, unlocks the door and sneaks in. And then you hear, crash! And Duggan climbs through a window, which is classic Duggan. Classic. Romana proceeds to, like, make fun of him for it. She's like, I bet you have, like, a, a good relationship with, uh, was it Glass, Glass, Glass? Person who fixes broken glass. <laughs> She's making fun of him for breaking glass, and he picks up like a bottle, like a bottle of wine, and just smashes it and does that instead of opening it. <laughs> <laughs> he smashes the bottle of wine to open it and then drinks out of it. As he does it, he's like, Well, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Crack. Which is the most ridiculous thing, and somehow. It's like funny and endearing instead of real stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm remembering something from the glass moment. Was it pronounced glacier in the show? I was super confused for a couple of seconds, and then it was clarified. Is that I don't know how you pronounce it to be honest. So I don't think it's glacier because when I hear glacier, I think of ice. 
Not glass. Glacier. <laughs> yeah, glacier. I think it's glazier, like with a Z, right? I I don't know. I've never, if I break glass, I just throw it away. No, you don't. That's true. We actually have a bin of broken glass out on the back porch right now because I want to make something out of it. So you need to call a glacier. Yeah. So I think I'm going to get concrete and I think I'm going to make a just a mosaic guy and put it out in the backyard. I don't know. I don't just want to throw it away. We had so- something got into our back porch and broke all of the glass bottles and stuff I had out there. I don't know. We don't know if it was a cat, I, yeah. a squirrel, a yeah. bird. Could be anything. We just don't know. Our neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Me in a, a fit of amnesia. The Count gives the professor some new plans since, like, he saw all the Mona Lisa's and stuff. He's like, all right, I'm going to let you fully in on this thing, what I want you to be making. And he's like, oh, this is the exact opposite of what I wanted to do, morally. Because his whole thing was, he was like, we're going to, we're doing this time thingy. And, like, imagine if you could take a whole bunch of eggs and make them into chickens really fast. Uh, but the, the the doctor says the reason why that won't work is because it's, it's stuck in a loop relative to itself. Yeah. So, like, it's just going to keep going until it dies, or you can't, like, stop it at the point that you want. That's not how it works. And he's like, this is the opposite of what I wanted to do, and also it won't, I can't, you don't have the resources. There's, you don't, you can't afford this. You can't afford to pull this plan off. And then Herman comes in with the Mona Lisa, and he's like, fuck you, I can't. We're going to sell ourselves some art. Meanwhile, in the past, which is a fun phrase to say. Sure. Uh, the doctor is put in those thumb screws and questioned a bit. And again, the count says more than the doctor does. And starts eating more scenery, um, nom, 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 nom. both past and present, because he's just talking about how great he is. And then in the present, he's talking to the countess about... All, all of this work throughout history, he kind of, like, brags about, like, doing a lot of, like, historical moments things of, like... They're, like, basically, he got stuck on the Earth from, like, the very beginning and, like, has been prodding humanity to be more technologically advanced so that the technology would be available so that he could leave. I, I think there's a meme that um that people like to post whenever this subject comes up. Uh, it's a guy from the History Channel. He, you know, looks kind of frazzled. Aliens. Yeah. That, that definitely is this meme. It's not the first time Doctor Who's done this either. Of, oh, we've been influencing humanity for ages. Futurama. Yeah, there's like five different groups that <laughs> are instrumental in humanity, like, growing up. Now I want to see a Doctor Who episode where... A whole bunch of like ancient aliens are just sort of tr- together or or competing with each other to try to influence humanity, but because they're all sort of influencing humanity in opposite directions, it all it's a wash. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, as as he's chewing the scenery in both past and present, then he starts freaking out in both past and present. All of his different selves start communing with each other. And we see these, like, this effect of, like, his, all of his different faces, and they're, like, fading, and he's like, and they're all like, we must do the thing! And we get to see him in, like, ancient Egyptian makeup, and he's got a cross on his face, and... There's lots of them. Lots of them. They all look like the same guy! Except for the green wormy face thing, that's also in the mix. That guy just broke his mask. And then the background, the doctor takes this opportunity to lick his thumb screws... He, like, puts it in his mouth, gets his thumbs out of it, and clamps it onto the guard's sword. And then he runs off, and the guard's like, hey! And he lifts his sword up, but it's got the the thumb screws on the end of it, so he can't use it. The doctor basically time travels out of there. Romana and Duggan have both been waiting for the doctor at this cafe, and she offers a sleeping Duggan uh, some coffee. And he's like, "Ah!" and, like, points a gun at her. (laughs) Am I the only one at this point who's thinking, I know Duggan is not a companion who's going to be sticking around, but I want him to be. (laughs) Yes. Like, imagine if he had just come along and it it had been, like, the Doctor, Romana, and Duggan for a while. Duggan just trying to punch everything. And breaking stuff. And being completely incompetent. Like, he seems like a better version of Harry Sullivan. 
Yeah. So Romana and him have a chat. They sort of figure out what's going on, but not exactly. Like, he must have went back in time and, like, set up all this Mona Lisa stuff. But that doesn't make sense, because why is he working on time travel? And the way, what he's doing right now isn't working. So they like, they decide to go back to the chateau. That's the word I've been thinking of this entire time. I've been saying house mansion thing. Chateau. So they decide to go back to the Count's chateau and figure some more stuff out. The doctor finds out that the Mona Lisa has been stolen, runs to go find Romana and Duggan, and they're not there. And he's like, man, I really hope they didn't go to the chateau. And then he reads their note that says, doctor, we've gone to the chateau. (laughs) And uh, we cut to the chateau where they have been captured and they're both like holding their hands up. The, basically, the Count says that uh, he wants Romana's help because the doctor said something about Romana in the past. Romana's a time lady. She could figure out this whole time thing. Says that she's real smart. So he's like, if you're real smart, fix my thing. So they go down to look at it, and she's like, I don't know if I'm going to help you. And then he's like, hey, Professor, would you go check the device? And he's like, sure. And he goes and he walks over in there, and he turns the machine on, and the Professor does a... Funny little dance. And then dies. And then becomes an old person. Yeah. He ages until he's just bones with hair still. It's a skeleton with a beard. That's a look. And uh, that's the end of episode three. And we're now into episode four, the last one, which I have only one title for. The most important punch in history. <laughs> which I call the last one. I had a different title, which was Split Ends. Oh. Scaroth is like... You see what I did to that guy? I'm going to do that to Paris if you don't help me. And then Romana's like, what do I care? Bunch of stupid humans. I'm not human. Why would I care? And then I think he, like, threatens Duggan. And she's like, what? No. And he's like, ha! You care so much! Called your bluff. And basically he says, listen, I just want to go back in time and stop my ship from exploding and save my people. That's not too bad, right? Meanwhile, the doctor has been brought in to the Countess, and he talks to her a bit. She shows the doctor a first draft of Hamlet, which he's like, oh yeah, I recognize the handwriting. And she's like, Shakespeare's? He's like, no, mine. He uh, sprained his wrist writing some sonnets, so. Uh, And then he starts reading it, and he's like, oh, he left that bit in? I told him that bit was bad. (laughs) So uh, I have a little interjection about this whole... Shakespeare thing. Is this about the Shakespeare episode in New Hope? Yeah, Shakespeare Code. And also the line, which is not from that episode, uh, The Doctor Lies. I'm curious <laughs> if the quote-unquote canon, I know there's no canon, it's Doctor Who, there's no such thing as canon. Contradiction, who cares, there's no canon. I get it. But if we pretend that there's canon for a moment, let's live in a little bubble where there's a canon. Uh, let's try to make sense of this. <laughs> Is the doctor lying about the Shakespeare thing? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he could he could be not lying because it's not what what would contradict it. Well, I mean, in Shakespeare code, he meets Shakespeare for the first time. Does he say it's the first time he's met Shakespeare? He acts like it's the first time. Who does? He does, or Shakespeare does? Well, Shakespeare definitely does. Yeah, he does. Yeah, I I, th- I think he's like fanboying. Uh. Which, by the way, D- David Tennant returned to the Globe uh, in uh, Good Omens. <laughs> I couldn't help but think of like, oh, it's the same place. He's been there before and talked to Shakespeare. <laughs> I don't really remember how Tennant acts in Shakespeare's Code, so I can't say. Yeah. Maybe he just forgot. He's, no, been... he's, been, a- he's been alive a long time. Yeah, <laughs> he's really old. Yeah, so maybe he forgot that he met Shakespeare at a later point in Shakespeare's life. Or maybe Shakespeare lies. Maybe the doctor lied the first time he met Shakespeare. No, wait. N- no, wait. Because I, th- I think there's some line in the Shakespeare code that the doctor is like, you can have that, that he wouldn't have written yet. So I don't know. I don't know the timeline of when he would have written anything. We've got to break this Shakespeare code, which is weird because that, that is a parody of the Da Vinci Code. Where things are written on the back of things. <laughs> Secret messages on the back of a thing. I just pictured Nicolas Cage looking on the back of the thing and it says, this is a fake. That's national treasure. I know, but I pictured it anyway. Because to me, national treasure and and fucking Da Vinci Code is the same shit. Even though I think I've seen the Da Vinci Code. And I know it's Tom Hanks and shit. National treasure is more fun. So the doctor's talking to the countess and is sort of trying to seed some doubt in her head. 
about who the Count is. He's like, do you even know who he is and stuff? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, do you know he's a green worm guy with one eye? And she's like, what? No, he's not. And then the doctor gets taken downstairs to meet the Count. And then she goes and she pulls out this, like, book that has, like, a secret compartment. And she pulls out these, like, ancient Egyptian scrolls in it. And she rolls it out. And there's all these, like, typical sort of Egyptian pictures. And then right there at the end is a green worm guy with an eye. And she's like, oh, shit, it's true. Because <laughs> there's a picture in this old thing. It must be true. <laughs> That's how truth works. You, f- you find something really old, and if it says it, it's true. That's what it, and also, you know, there's just a picture of a random worm guy uh, in this random place, and, oh, it's got to be my husband. <laughs> What? Because <laughs> the guy said so? <laughs> it all checks out. I mean, the epistemology here is a little bit off, but, but that's normal. You run into that a lot. It's realistic. People's epistemology generally is pretty bad. So the doctor goes downstairs, hopes that Romana isn't working on a time machine, but she is working on a time machine. But she's like, it's cool. He's just going to go back and unsplit himself. But the doctor's like, no, nah, it's, it's real bad. Don't do it. The count's like, I'm going to go to say goodbye to my wife before I leave for the past and t- he tells Herman, the butler, to kill them all. And as he goes upstairs, uh, the countess countess pulls a gun on the count and says, who are you? Really? Tell me, are you the guy on this scroll? And he rips his face off! No, oh, he's done with the mask now. That's fair. The jig is up. It's literally the exact same footage, by the way. Is it? Yeah. I didn't notice. And then he's, she's like, oh no, you're ugly. We can't be married. And, uh, he's like, you've served your purpose and turns a, presses a button on his, I don't know. Bracelet that she's got. Yeah. And it kills her. And he's like, sorry, no hard feelings though, because I'm going to end everything. (laughs) It's not just you. Don't take it personally. This isn't even gonna, like, this is, this is a small murder in comparison to what I'm about to do. Meanwhile, Romana's like, I, I put a, a time limit on the machine. He's only gonna go back in time, and he'll only be there for two minutes before he gets sent back. And the doctor's like, he can undo the universe in two minutes. Duggan, the universe or just the planet? Yeah, just the planet. Just life on Earth. Sorry. Not the whole universe. Not the whole universe. Just, just Earth. The, just Earth. Not even just Earth. Just humanity. Maybe the doctor shouldn't have stopped. Duggan, by the way, is is back in that cellar. They put him back in the cellar. And they've been put in the cellar as well. And they're like, what do we do? And they both go, Duggan? And they both look at him and he's like, all right. And he just fucking charges the door and opens it. Knocks it down with his his body, as Duggan uh, does. And uh, they're going to go destroy the machine, but too late. The Count is there and he's like, peace out, yo. And activates the device. Gets sent back in time, and then the machine catches fire, so they can't use it, and it's it's too late. They've lost. Now, what they're they're like? Let's. Well, we have to go back in time now, so let's get to the TARDIS, and then we run through Paris. <laughs> we get some more footage of Paris. Yeah, this bit felt very. What's the word? Padded. Gratuitous. And they every time they show these shots of Paris, it's always the same piece of music too, which I really like that music. It's like da 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 and you were singing along to it, which is we're in Paris, we're really in Paris. That's that's all that's what those shots are about. Just how they're super actually in Paris. Okay, you mentioned earlier the a scene that was probably the best scene in Doctor Who. I think this scene is the best scene in Doctor Who. No, it's not. It's so good. All right, talk about it. The Doctor has parked his TARDIS in an art gallery. Right before, a little bit before they get there, we see two people staring at the TARDIS as if it is an art piece and discussing the art of it. And it is... John Cleese. Yes, John Cleese and Eleanor Braun. I don't really know who she is, to be honest. But I know who the hell John Cleese is. I think I've heard of him. I mean, I don't know if this is the first time there's ever been, like, a cameo. Like, a celebrity cameo in Doctor Who. But this certainly feels like it to me. There may have been before, I just didn't know who the hell it was. There's definitely been famous people before, but I don't know if there's ever been, like, a, you know, a cameo. Like, look at this famous person! One of the last things that, that they remark on is, is like, it's it's one of the notable things about the TARDIS is that it's there, and then it disappears. <laughs> 
I expected one of them to go, and and you know, one of the wonderful things about it is it's not there. But like, you don't really need that though, because like that's implied. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna read it because I I love all of the dialogue in this serial. Uh, to me, one of the most curious things about this piece is its wonderful a functionalism. Um, hey, yes, you're gonna have to be like thirty percent more snooty. <laughs> If you're gonna read this scene. I, I, I can't be snooty. I'm too nice. 30% more snooty! Go! Um, to me, one of the most curious things about this piece is its wonderful... a functionalism. Yes, I see what you mean. Divorced from its function and seen purely as a piece of art, its structure of line and color is curiously counterpointed by the redundant vestiges of its function. And since it has no call to be here, the art lies in the fact that it is here, then, yes, it disappears, and then they just go, exquisite. Absolutely exquisite. And John Cleese does an okay sign. I think no- notable about the scene is is that when they f- they're they first talking about it, we don't actually see what they're talking about. Th- we see that they're in a, in a at a vernissage or something, and they're, they're talking about something that is a- out of frame. And then we see that it's the TARDIS... And then it disappears. And honestly, they're not, like, wrong. Like, it also feels like they are talking about the TARDIS, in a way. Because it is, like, it's a police box. Yeah, it's an everyday object that's in a museum. Like... And it it, it is sort of taken out of its context. Like... There's some actual substance to what they're saying. They're kind of talking about the, the, um, what's the movement called? Uh, the the ready-made... Uh, movement where you would take an everyday object or any object as it is and put it in the art gallery or well put it in the exhibition and and say this is my work of art this is my statement and just have it be an ob- like a, a, a kitchen sink or or anything or a bathroom sink i think was was one but yeah it's just you take an object a found object and display it as a work of art. I think that's interesting, though, that, like, because the TARDIS itself is a police box that has been taken so far from its function that that we now think of it as the TARDIS without even thinking of it as a police box. Because nobody knows box. what the fuck a police box is anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No one thinks of it as, like, a telephone booth, like, when they first see it. that Like, it's been so far removed from that. Like, and that was, like, its original purpose was that it would blend into some place. But now it's like that, like that image is so iconic Iconic now. Yeah, that it had, it is super far removed from its function now to the point that if you saw that in the wild, like in a place where you would be like, why is the TARDIS here? Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't think, oh, it's a police box. You'd be like, that's the TARDIS. So I think that's interesting. But uh, they, they go back 400 million years ago, which I don't think the math is right there, but I don't think it matches up with something they've done previously. I read that on Wikipedia. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you don't think shit. We're back at the beginning. We're back at the the where we were in the first, the beginning of the first episode, and we see that spider orb. Spider and, uh, orb. Spider orb. Duggan goes, "That's a spaceship." You know, I'm I'm gonna stop you right there. Could you could you redo that line with a little more surprise? That's a spaceship. I feel like you read it exactly the same. Okay, can we can we get one more for f- just to be sure that we got it? That's a spaceship! There you go, that's the one. Okay, and it's a wrap. The doctor scoops up this goop, hands it to Duggan, and says, that's your ancestors. And Duggan's like, gross! And basically what happened was when the Jaggeroth ship exploded, it kick-started life. That's why the ship has to... Which is kind of like a bummer, like... It's one thing to go back in time and be like, I'm going to make it so humanity never existed. It's another thing to be like, I'm going to go back in time so that I don't die. And it's like, no, sorry, you gotta, or else humanity doesn't exist. So you you just, you have to die. Um, I think it's an interesting concept. Also, I've seen this concept before, but technically it was after, and it was by the same guy. I had heard a lot that Shada was rewritten to be Dirk Gently, but, like, the villain in Dirk Gently, this is the same thing. It's it's the same premise of going back to the beginning of time to take off in your spaceship and save your people, but it's going to fuck over humanity. It's the exact same premise in the Dirk Gently Solistic Detective Agency. Douglas Adams reuses his shit a lot. Yeah. So Scaroth shows up and it's like, I, it will change. He's going to stop the spaceship from taking off. And uh, Duggan punches him right in the face. And then he disappears due to that two minute time limit. 
Which, what's amazing about this is, like, coming from, like, unit years where you're like, oh my god, the Brig thinks he can solve all of his problems by shooting at it. And Duggan is very much like a, a character like that, where he thinks he can solve all his problems with punches. And he does! He does! It works. He saves the whole world with one good punch. And that's what the doctor says. That, Duggan, I think that is the most important punch in history. Uh, they get back to the TARDIS and the... The ship explodes, and life exists. Hurrah! Meanwhile, in the present, future, present, time's weird. The Count returns to his device, but he doesn't have his mask on. He's just green googly guy. And Herman the butler is down there, and he turns around and is like, What the fuck is that? And just chucks a thing at him. And the Count's like, Herman, no! And then that's just the whole device explodes. Killing him, presumably killing Herman... And destroying most of the chateau. In fact, we learn all of the fake Mona Lisas burned up except for one. No, no, no. All of the fake Mona Lisas and the one real one burned up. Only one of the fakes was what survived. Yes, one the of one the that fakes. said this, this is, a, is fake. a fake. The real Mona Lisa burned, and all the fake ones burned I except mean, for all one. Real, technically. Well, yeah, that's what the doctor says. He's like, it's painted by Mona Lisa, and Duggan's like, Mona Lisa oh, painted it. <laughs> It's a self-portrait. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, but like, he's like, but it says this is a fake on the back. And he's like, still, he's like, it's no, art. He's like, no, I'll look. <laughs> what if they x-ray it? He's like, it's still art. They're having this conversation on the Eiffel Tower. Because why not? Romana says something about computer art back where they're from, bring that back up. And he's like, well, where are you from? And then the doctor says... Well, if you want to know where you're from, you figure out where you're going and backtrack from there. And then he's like, well, where are you going? And the doctor's like, I don't know. And then Romana's like, me either. Bye. <laughs> and then they leave. Duggan buys a, a Mona Lisa postcard and waves down to the doctor and Romana. They wave back. The end. The end. That is the end of... The City of Death! Now, about that title, City of Death, I mean, I get the city part, and I guess there's reference to death, there's someone dies, but, like, I don't see the connection between the city and death specifically. It's not like it's a city where where death is... I read something about this. Paris is often referred to as City de la Mort, which sounds like... City de la Mort, yeah. Which is City of Death. That makes sense, I guess, but it's a bit far-fetched. If it had the French title, it would have worked better, I think. But with the English title, it doesn't really... The play on words doesn't land. The, the connection to the story doesn't isn't really there very much. So I think it's kind of not a great title for it. Well, it wasn't the original title. The original title was called uh, The Gamble with Time. But considering they got rid of the casino the aspect... The gambling aspect? Yeah, that wouldn't have worked. Uh, we should also say we've been saying that this episode was written by Douglas Adams, but... It was co-written. It was co it, Yeah, it was originally uh, written by David Fisher, and then it was rewritten completely by Douglas Adams and Graham Williams. What's the... Because the credited name is just a... David Agnew. That's a made-up person. Yes. Which I believe has been used before uh, on Doctor Who as well. Yeah, David Agnew is is uh, the kind of like Alan Smithy. But yeah, it's a, it's it's a combination for David Fisher, Douglas Adams, and Graham Williams. I don't want to shortchange the other dudes who helped write this and just be like Douglas Adams, Douglas Adams, Douglas Adams. But um, that's that's the serial. That's the episode. Um, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be back for final thoughts. Hey, thanks, Matt. This week on Myopia Defend Your Childhood. Myopia Defend Your Childhood is a nostalgic movie podcast where we rewatch the movies of the 80s and 90s as we walk down memory lane. From action to animation, horror to sci fi, we rewatch the movies my panelists and I grew up watching to see how our pasts hold up. Join us every other Thursday on the ESO Network. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Letterboxd, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever podcasts are found. Thanks. And we're back. Welcome back. Tony, do you know what time it is? I sure do. It <sighs> is, let's see, 34 minutes past 8, making it 8.34. Not in my time zone. It's it's actually, it's 2.35. That's the time. How are you a whole minute ahead of us? 
Oh, wait, it's 8.35 now. <laughs> for someone who gets, like, so antsy sitting around doing a podcast for two hours, yeah. we get to this point, instead of being like, all right, we're right at the end, let's power through this, you take the time to do a bit that slows everything down. It's the only thing I got. And you're keeping Vince awake? Yeah. Hey, I'm keeping me awake. I have a cup of tea here. I'm planning on having toast. Hey, don't encourage her. Mm, toast. <laughs> I've Tell been me. making so much cinnamon toast. Man, now I want cinnamon toast. Cinnamon toast does sound good. If we finish this podcast, we can make some cinnamon toast. All right, well, let's finish it. What's holding us back? We got to do a segment. Okay, let's do it. What's... Why are you being so weird? <laughs> let's just finish the podcast. What segment do we do at this point? I don't know. Yes, you do. Let's finish the podcast, you weirdo. What time is it, though? It's time for... What time do we... What time's the thing that we do now? What? What's Are you th- asking for what the segment is or what time it is? What segment? Because I already told you what time it is. What segment is it time for? Plugs. No! It's time. It's over. We did it. Goodbye, and I love you. Thanks for coming to my hey, side talk. Hey, Vince, do you know what time it is? It's 2.36 now. <laughs> what? Do you know what segment we do at this in this portion of the podcast? Wait, Joseph. Is it one of the later segments? Joseph. Yes. Joseph, look at me. Uh Uh-huh. Are you listening? I'm listening. Joseph? What? Are you listening to me? Yes. It's time for Final Thoughts. Ah! Final Thoughts! Well, I, I like it. I think it's fun. I don't know if there's much else to say. Like, I didn't get, like, a deep, profound whatever out of it. It wasn't, like, big message thing. It was just sort of fun ideas, some fun gags, some fun little dialogue bits. Uh, it's a, it's a fun serial. I don't, I don't know that I'd like, that I have anything, like, deeper to say about it. Cause I don't think it was going for anything deeper. I feel like it was a fairly straightforward, just a, a romp. Through, through time and Paris. I'm so mad because I was going to say romp. Now i got to think of something else to say. Are those, are those your final thoughts? I, I think so. I'm really bad at final thoughts. I'm really bad at, at, at anything sort of organized. So I will say that those are probably my final thoughts. All right, Tony? Uh, yeah, this was a su- like it was romp? just it was a romp. <laughs> it was it was a romp. It was fun. Um, I had a lot of like really quick, clever dialogue, which is always something that I find very fun. Like the bantering. Anytime you've got a companion and the doctor like bantering back and forth, it doesn't super matter what else is happening in the serial. Like it's gonna be a fun one. That said, the you know you've got some really great side characters. Duggan is like so much fun. Like, to the point where you're like, I wish we could keep him. Just him running around and breaking things and being just sort of a big goober. Are you okay? I just, I'm sorry, I just realized something. The original script was set in Las Vegas. So I bet Duggan was Was supposed to be American. Was American. Sorry, continue. That character makes a lot more sense as, like, a brash, dumb American. (laughs) And also, like, Count Scarleone sounds like some sort of, like, mobster. Yeah. That would make sense in America, too. Um, But yeah, he's great, too, the Count. Um, I mean, there are times where he's just, like, clearly the actor is just having so much fun giving this sort of, like, big, over-the-top delivery. And he's not big and over-the-top all the time. He knows when to do it. And he knows when to be under, um, which is also fun. To kind of watch him, like, ping ping pong pong back and forth between those two. So, yeah, I mean, like, this one's fun, and part of the reason why it's so fun is because of the characters and the dialogue, and I liked it. I I, I agree with everything you guys have said. I also think, like, the plotting is really good. It's very, very clever plotting. Like, the whole plan makes sense to me. I think it's very well Yeah, a lot of the times where there are plans, you're just like... Okay, that's the plan, I guess. The reason, like, why he's doing it and the reason why it needs to be stopped both make sense to me. You know, he wants to save his people, but also the Doctor wants to save an entire, you know, planet. Though, to be fair, I mean, it's saving one race or the other. So that's a little, like, who's to who's to judge? But I guess you're changing history at the same time. Right. And the Doctor's not super into that sometimes. <laughs> Probably. Depending on the day. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love I love the characters. I love Duggan. I love Scaroth. I, and it's just so funny. And I love that scene with John Cleese. So there's a lot to love here. And it's, it's I want to say it's a romp. <laughs> um, and you know what? I think it was filmed in Paris. So. I did hear that. 
And it, it certainly looked like Paris. Or that was some really, really good color separation overlay. And we know at this point in time, they didn't have really good color separation overlay. Yeah. But yeah, I liked it. I, I love Douglas Adams writing for Doctor Who. It's so good. It's funny and clever and fun. Guys, watch it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, before we go, is there anything you would like to plug? I have a podcast nowadays i haven't put out an episode in a while because i've i was editing an episode and then it crashed and i lost the shit i didn't lose the recording just all of the progress i'd made editing so that just all the work yeah so i gotta start over on that one and it's really annoying uh so it's we're dealing with some delays right now but uh by the time this goes up we might have new episodes but we've got a whole bunch of episodes already on podbean it's it's, uh ip consultants dot podbean dot com uh where insane ian and i uh talk about uh various intellectual properties and uh what we think could should shouldn't be done with them uh moving forward uh we we talk about stuff stuff like uh adaptations remakes reboots sequels prequels things like that we also go into stuff like oh leave this ip alone but if you had to do something with it here's some ideas sort of stuff so we just sort of play around with the the idea of other people's ideas because it's fun and it's very sort of just tongue in cheek giving unsolicited advice to all these well mostly movie studios but you know television comic book game companies and all that stuff uh whatever we feel like talking about uh we've got a bunch of episodes and uh there's more coming i guess i would like to at some point in- invite the two of you to do a, a special episode on on the topic of doctor who perhaps and what could be done in the future of doctor who as a sort of crossover episode because i don't think ian watches doctor who so i don't think he'd want to do an episode on this subject so i actually have like a doctor i have like who i want them to be as a character like totally planned out in my head I have an idea for an, a, a, a reboot. Yeah, we both had to come up with them for a podcast that didn't end up working out, but like... Well, I mean, mine wasn't for that. Was, I have an idea for a reboot for, for completely different reasons. Yours is bad, though. Mine's good. <laughs> I also want to say I've listened to IP Consultants, and I, I really enjoy it. So it gets my thumbs up. So that's... that's a, uh, And occasionally I'll put up music uh, every once in a while. I haven't done it a lot lately, but I've been working on some stuff in semi-secret that might pop up eventually uh, when I'm back in the mood to do uh, music properly. Uh, But yeah, uh, that tends to go up on vincentdl.bandcamp.com or soundcloud.com slash vincentdl. I also have Twitter, vincentdl. Oh, and there might might be new Illidan material coming eventually, possibly, depending on if we can finish anything. Nice. There's a couple of things uh, I want to plug before we go. First off, I'm going to be on a podcast that a friend of mine has started up called The Story of the Story. It's uh, my friend Jeff Hewitt. He's an author. Uh, he is interviewing other authors about their favorite stories that they have written. And I did uh, an episode about a novel I co-wrote that I also turned into a screenplay called Road Trippy, which there's hopefully going to be a Kickstarter for the the novel soon so i'm not sure when that's going up it should be the next couple of weeks i think so keep an eye out for the story of the story i'll post it on our social medias when it pops up i mentioned you at one point in there vince unless he's cut it out but i also wanted to plug something i'm very proud of tony for she just completed the first season of the unseen world 13 episodes they're all up on the roku yes uh the heartland network channel it will still airs on Heartland. It's going like, to be airing and in reruns. Um, and we're, we've are we already started to work on season two. We're planning our trips out to, to get filming done. And I've, we've already put together a, a big list of locations and ordered it like by priority and what we think is most interesting. I am I was going through it the other day and I was getting like excited just because like, the, the list of places that we put together, it's going to be it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be a lot of work. I like put everything to bed and was like, we did a season and it's great and I'm done. And then I like started work- like looking at season two and was like, oh right, 
pre-production and production. <laughs> I've got to start doing those things again. Hey, thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to say that I just finished, I just put up, I have a, like, professionally website now about me. Um, and you can find that at TonyBHeath.com. There is a section for Unseen World on there that has, like, uh, a couple of previews and a couple of clips from the show. So if you don't have a Roku and don't get Heartland but kind of want to check out and see what it's like, you can find it there. And there's also a, a lot of uh, clips and stuff like that on the, the Facebook as well. A lot of the teasers are up on the Facebook fan page, yeah. which is... Uh, Facebook.com slash See Unseen World. See Unseen World. And we're See Unseen World on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Out of those, we probably use the Facebook and the Instagram the most. I kind of forget that it has a Twitter. But yeah, I'm very proud of you. I think it's a really good show. And you did a whole season. It turned out pretty okay. Congratulations. Well done. Good job. Our finale, which is airing right now, actually, I think. It's 8 o'clock. On Friday, so yeah, it's airing right now, which means it has already aired, but it's about the Space and Rocket Center at Huntsville, Alabama, which, like, blew my mind to go to, and I've been waiting for this episode to air for, like, a while now. I think I I I might have talked about it the day that we went, because it was so cool. Space. Space, man. I want to go to space. I want to go to space so bad. Vince loves things in space. I, I, I do enjoy a bit of space. More than Paris. But, you know, jokes. I like this episode. And if you like this episode, you can check out more on WatchYourAssalon.com. And be sure to rate and comment on our iTunes, because that does iTunes magic. The more comments we get, the more iTunes uh, decides to show us to other people, the easier it is for us to be found. And that's one of like the best things that you can do for us as like a fan of this podcast is help other people find us. And also, if you'd like to help us, uh, you can go to watchyourassalon.com slash support, and there you'll find a link to our Patreon page, which you can get to just by going to patreon.com slash watchathon. And there you can donate a monthly amount to get all kinds of neat rewards, like day early episodes, uncut video of the podcast records, bonus episodes, live streams where we watch the episodes together, uh, and we've recently started a Discord server. Yeah, if you're a patron, by the way, it's at any level, come hang out in the Discord server. It's super fun. We have a room that's solely dedicated to pictures of cute animals. Sometimes we talk about uh, the episode in there after we've watched it. When New Who was airing, we would talk about it. But, like, there's a couple of rooms and... Talk about movies that we've just seen. Yeah, whatever, whatever, like, anybody wants to chat about. Um, we're working on getting the guests in it, too, but... Vince has been in there a couple times. Yeah? Have I? Where have I been? What is happening? You've have you been, been on the, the Discord? You've been in the Discord server. Yeah, I think I have. You commented a few times. We're trying to get more guests in there to hang out, but it's easier for people to hang out if there's people to talk to. So yeah, if you're patron, the Patreon patron, again, at any level, dollar or more, you can come hang out with us on our, our Discord server. Um, also on our support page, again, which is at watchyourasslon.com slash support, there is a link to a, our Amazon wish list where you can sponsor an episode of the podcast by purchasing the corresponding serial on DVD for us. We'll mention you in the podcast and put your name on our Friends of Rassilon page. Speaking of, special thanks to Matt Golden for sponsoring this episode. Hey, thanks, Matt. It's come too much of a thing. I can't do it. There's too much pressure. <laughs> and I also want to give a, a special shout out to uh, Vincent E.L. for doing our theme song for us. Hey, thanks, thanks Matt. And uh, tune in next time when we talk about the creature from the pit. Yuck. I fell into the pit. Oh, man. Do you think the Parks and Rec people will be in that episode? Do you think they're going to be in the next episode of Doctor Who? I don't see why not. Well, the creature from the pit is obviously Andy Dwyer. Yeah. I don't think that. We'll have to, we'll have to find out. Wait and see. All right. But until then, keep calm and wrestle on. Keep calm and wrestle a tasteful tuna. Goodbye, and I love you in a platonic parasocial way. Absolutely exquisite. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.